<laughs> my thinking on this was that I've been doing all this music sampling people talking about stuff yeah. and some of these people are public intellectuals and some of them are former Navy SEALs but it's all people that I think have got something of value to add to the, con the current conversation mm -hmm. of what's important right now at this really important point of our development as a species. Anyway, so yeah, I could, I'd be thinking about all these people as kind of characters and archetypes and what have you, and as it expanded almost like a universe, I started to think of it like the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And so it was like the Meaning Wave universe, and each person had a part to play. And I figured, well, Peterson, who was the first one I did, was kind of like the Iron Man figure, who, uh, you know, he's kind of like earthly, science-based character. Uh, he's not too out there or too crazy or anything, you know, he was talking about stuff that was on an earthly level that people could, regular people could relate to and stuff. In the same way they launched the Marvel Cinematic Universe with Iron Man, who was a guy who built a suit. You could imagine that being a true thing that could happen, you know. And then it expands and then you get to like Doctor Strange who like brings in the idea of uh, magic and then suddenly you can do anything. And uh, so I was thinking about the characters in it like this. And then I was thinking about the IDW as kind of being like the Avengers who, you know, were a sort of group of, of powered individuals who were gathered together for a critical moment. Um, so as, as regards to who each one was, I don't know. I mean, what, but before, what, what, what is your take on the IDW anyway? What, is, what does it mean to you? What is it really? Oh, well, I'd like to, for a little bit, just go down the road you're going down. All right, let's do that then. Because, but uh, I'm interested in finding that out. Um, what I was noticing is that one is a little, if, I like the irony yeah. of the fact that at least one of the characters in the story that you're telling, Jordan Peterson, mm -hmm. tells a story about how you create mythologies about mythologies and you abstract up. And you're telling a story which is embedding his story in the context of the mythology of storytelling. Yeah. Um, and I was noticing as you were talking, I was sort of imagining how this shows up in all the different kinds of mythologies. Like, are they actually Greek heroes or are they um, like... I have like a comic book image that has a whole bunch of different like shamanic heroes from a bunch of different distinct lineages all somehow being called into place. But the, this notion of there being like a reference to the mythopoetic layer, the reference to the, to the archetype layer, and then each, each of these particular individual human beings for their own reasons, you know, because of who they are and how they show up in the world, has access to some portion of the mythopoetic layer. Mm -hmm. And we're in mythopoetic times, like yeah. that's for sure. The mythopoetic layer you can also call the archetypal. You can call the archetypal, yeah, it's yeah. the two words. Um, yeah. It's not ludicrous. If you imagine that the archetypes are always existing, and so the superheroes will take of archetypal, archetypal structures. Yeah, they've been, our, they've been our gods for a while, and they've introduced those right. concepts to uh, the past couple of generations. Mm -hmm. Just as sort of religion sort of died off in the West, or like the religion that we had, uh, up rose Superman and Wonder Woman and the X-Men and all these people to sort of take these places. So a child who's born now who might not read the Bible stories will certainly read the uh, superhero stories mm -hmm. or he'll see them in movies. And if, if the, the IDW are kind of self-selecting, they've been self-selected by the culture, it would make sense that they would also fill those kind of archetypal holes, that they'd be required to fill those archetypal holes. Oh, that okay. Well, then we can use that to maybe make sense of the question you asked me. Mm -hmm. Um, some of the characteristics that seem to be showing up in these individuals are, for example, courage. Yes. Uh, they, they have the archetypal virtue of courage, which is sort of notably absent from our... Yeah, there was, someone asked me, like, why I even made some music with Peterson in it in the first place, or what I liked about him, and the first thing that came to mind was courage, was yeah. bravery. Yeah. Was the, someone standing up for something. Right. Whatever that is, in, in the face of... of and, and you can imagine that, that at like a deep level, like in our, in our bones, or even in our like reproductive organs, mm -hmm. the part of us that has been all about how the hell do tribes survive, mm -hmm. has a deep sense of when there, are, when there is no courage, mm -hmm. we're probably fucked. Mm -hmm. So when, when we feel an absence of courage, yes. mm -hmm. and then courage shows up, we're like, okay, that, There's whatever that is, yes. it needs to happen. Yeah. Right. And um, so that's one, one piece. Mm -hmm. And then the other piece that we also see is, well, I guess I'm going to break this into two. One is this notion of a, uh, an unreasonable attraction to the truth, mm. right? So a sense of a willingness to say, to, to take pain, to like suffer in, in defense of what is perceived to be true, mm. right? So rather than 
being able to capitulate or to equivocate, saying, no, I'm just going to kind of like come in and say what I think is true. Mm. And take the almost, almost blindly, not, not like mm. calculating I'm going to take the consequences because I think it's a good idea. Mm. But for some reason, I'm just wired as one of these people who just can't feel good about things not being true. Mm. And then the other aspect over here is something about stepping out like a, a bigger picture, like zooming out and taking a look at things that are not right in front of us and trying to say, like, wait a minute, something's going on. And again, like if you think about this in terms of just straight evolution, you can imagine that there's a situation where we've been encamped in a valley for a long time. And it's worked out. We've got a good way of being. And, but we're noticing, for example, that maybe the hunt isn't producing as well as it used to, or the watering hole seems to be getting drier every couple of years. And most people still are just kind of like, that's not their, that's not their thing. Right? They're just focused on what's going on. But a couple of folks, they step back. And they're like, wait a minute. What's that mean? Like, what's happening here? And suddenly they're like, whoa, hold on, guys. We may have to leave. Mm. Now, leaving the valley is dangerous as shit. Right? Mm. Going from where you are, where things work, and you understand what's happening to a new place is a really bad idea. Mm. So it's not going to be well received, which is why it takes a certain kind of courage to be willing <laughs> to step up and say it. But because we've had to do that a lot to be humans, and, and humans more than any other animal. Right? We're the only animal that is, in fact, design the ability to get up from a whole niche, like to leave the African savanna and migrate to the, to the uh, Arctic. Mm. <clears throat> We're the only animal that has to have some system that's able to be able to detect when it's time to do that. Mm -hmm. All right, so then this is the ability to step back and try to figure out, like, okay, what is the basis that we can actually use to perceive a bigger picture mm -hmm. that allow us to make good choices in, a, in an environment where something is wrong? And it's going to be very subtle. Like, you can't w name it very well mm. if it's at the mythopoetic layer. So maybe that's what I think, is that that's what's happening. It's showing up. Yeah. So it's also perhaps a superpower to be able to detect that. I think it's a, if, we, if we're using the word superpower in its mm. archetypical sense, mm. it is for sure a superpower, as we just described it. Yeah, yeah and it's also the whole the times summon the man or the speaker mm. or whatever. Whoever is required at that point in time always seems to show up. Mm -hmm. And uh, now whoever's showing up is showing up. And it's the internet is allowing that to happen. It's kind of... Yeah, well... Yeah, yeah, this is, I mean, because it, the spread. It's still one of those things that people don't, I don't think people fully grasp the, the enormity of it. Mm. The, an idea, a person can say a thing and it can just fucking reverberate mm. throughout everything. So, I mean, I've spoken about this before, but uh, I feel that Joe Rogan is by far the most influential broadcaster of the last decade. Mm. And it's probably more influential than any broadcaster who came before him. At this point, a selection of guests on his show can shift the course of culture completely. Someone can go on there and introduce a new concept to millions of people that will then spread, and people could adopt that thing immediately, whatever it is. Uh, with regards to the IDW as superheroes, I don't know where that puts Rogan. Didn't you think Nick Fury? I like the Nick Fury feel. He certainly has a Nick Fury feel to him. But yeah, and then, but then I was like, maybe Eric Weinstein's Nick Fury because it's Weinstein mm. who seems to be kind of pulling things funny, together so a bit and seems to see something coming that requires these particular individuals to be assembled. This is a, a generational thing. Uh -huh. I, I connect to Nick Fury as Nick Fury and his Howling Commandos. Yeah. Not Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. Yes, there you so go. When he's Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., <laughs> Eric Weinstein. But I, this is it. Yeah, I, yeah I, I grew up with, you know, the first Fury, but he's been completely eclipsed by Samuel L. Jackson Fury in completely. my mind. Yeah, totally different guy. Like full blown. Yeah, so if you're thinking about the guy who's sort of like the, 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 the super spot. Yeah, the guy cigar like, chomping. Yeah, the guy who can like Man's make, man. That's, that's Rogan. Bad motherfucker. Yeah, 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 that's yeah, Rogan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you think about the guy who's like you know, more of the, the intelligence operative, who is able to figure out how to make things happen inside large, complex bureaucracies where there's betrayers here and there, and kind of, but can, you know, really is at the end of the day, at his core, the same guy, right, at his essence, and can then bring people together on the basis of hero, right, they call out the hero essence when it's needed. That's much more Eric. Yeah. Much more Eric once. That's exactly the call, call out the hero essence when needed. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a, very, that's a key thing. And, but it's that we now have that. This is part of the whole sort of uh, internet versus old media thing. It just wasn't possible before. In the same way that, uh, was it Kirby? Was it Morrison? Anyway, either Kirby or Morrison. Would say, you know, would say that comics is kind of the ultimate art form because you can do anything within it and you can tell a story as long as you need to and you can have any kind of special effects and you know, it's, it's kind of, doesn't have the limitations 
of movies or television. And the internet has done that with idea spreading and meme spreading. It doesn't have the limitations that television or newspapers or any of these things had. You can spread the meme, as Chance McKenna would talk about, in an almost infinite fashion. You can take an idea and it can disseminate as, as, far, as, as far as it can in a way that just wasn't possible before, wasn't imaginable before. Let's, let's take it further than that. Because as you, as you were saying it, I was trying to feel into the like, comics and then internet. And I was noticing that, all right, let's just do, do it this way. Um, the thing that happens in the internet when you're doing something on the internet, I guess kind of like what we're doing, is that you're engaging in a, um, what the hell is that called? A beautiful corpse? Is that right? Remember that phrase in art? Um, in, know, in, like in, in broadcast, in a mode like, say, um, you know, the moment that the Beatles were on the Ed Sullivan show, mm -hmm. there's a huge impression of, of, a, of an idea into the culture. Yeah. But it goes one direction and it's received. And the ability for that to then become generative, creative on its own basis, is only out here, right? Mm -hmm. So a bunch of kids, of course, for sure, were inspired by the Beatles and you generated rock and roll and kind of moved back out. But on the internet, what happens is, is that if somebody watches this, um, perhaps there's say a fabric that's trying to be expressed. And it's not our responsibility or our power to express all of it. All we have responsibility for is to move it a little bit further and to participate a little bit, our piece. Anybody else who happens to be participating in this in any way, watching it, commenting on it, creating their own video in response, like tomorrow, obviously this is a virtual tomorrow, tomorrow after they watch it, they could create something else and part of that fabric and they're equivalently empowered to everybody else to actually be participating in that. So what that does is that actually erases. Remember like, I think it was Foucault who did the birth of the author? We're talking about the death of the author, the end of the notion of the human being as the agent of creativity and the recovery of the notion of there being some kind of more collaborative sense where you're generating and pulling and the, the source of creation is happening outside of us entirely. Yeah. There's, there's something really interesting as well about the kind of marriage of high and low culture that we've got these incredible deep ideas coming out into the culture and then we're kind of you're turning it into music you're turning it into something that's really accessible but it doesn't feel because of the the time we're in and the way that the internet works it kind of feels right like th those those barriers between high and low culture seem to have been kind of almost completely if you're born after 1990 they don't exist mm -hmm. you don't have a concept of that mm -hmm. really so yeah, this is the this idea is, that it came yeah. out of Joe Rogan. I mean, the idea that Joe Rogan is kind of the, the herald of, of a yeah, kind well, it of makes complete intellectual it would, reawakening. Of course it would be Joe Rogan, yeah. because uh, Joe Rogan is kind of honest with himself enough to know that he doesn't know everything. Mm. And lots of smart people aren't smart enough to know they don't know everything. Mm. And mm. Uh, Rogan's, you know, he's, he's inquisitive. Mm. And uh, he's interested. And he's also a trippy individual. There's something about, you talk about sovereignty quite a lot. Like, Rogan is someone with a huge amount of sovereignty from the fighting, from the kind of deep embodied nature of a lot of what he's doing, which seems to translate into the kind of having the courage to go into the intellectual realms and, like you say, kind of admit that you don't know something. Well, there's, there's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, when we, one of the things that you didn't just mention was that he also, he made his living as a stand-up comedian. That's what he means. Yeah, that's a fucking massive part of it and continues to. Massive, yeah. It but continues he continues to. it. It's not like that's a side gig. That's like his main passion. And that's a skill set, right? That's a capacity to simultaneously be able to use your mind to think of and receive things, to convey through speech, but to read a room. It's the hardest thing I can think of. Reality. Yeah. It's a level above DJing on that. DJing is hard for mm. the whole reading a room and working out mm. how to take people on a journey, but then making them laugh. It's fucking, that's the hardest shit. And that's why comedians don't get any good until they've been doing it for about 20 years. Mm. Like, no, no young comedian is actually very good. They might say something funny now and again, they might be good at Twitter, but like, they're no good. They're not good. They're not good on that level of true greatness that a great comedian is, until they've been doing it for fucking 20 years or something. Yeah. Till, till they don't give a shit. Day. Till they don't give a shit. Yeah, yeah that's, that's one of the... Well, think, they have to yeah. be able to be in that space of flow. Yes. And have the skill set yes. to then be in that space of flow. Yes. Because right? you have to have trained yourself to have the capacity. Mm -hmm. Flow by itself is going to get it done. Yeah. Um, so then what you say <laughs> is that his sovereignty, when you're talking about his sovereignty, his sovereignty in this, in this environment is very large. Mm -hmm. right? He has a capacity to be able to perceive what's happening. He has a capacity to be able to notice the way that it's being expressed in the real environment of an actual dialogue so that it will be heard with an audience. He can feel the audience and understand how the audience is going to be able to respond to what's happening. He himself and his body has already been trained to be able to be punched in the face and not shirk. So as things are happening to him, they might actually be pushing him. That's not going to move him at all. 
So it's actually able to hold like a particular location in the dialogue that enables the dialogue to be able to be whatever it can be and then increase its capacity to be heard using his skillfulness as a, as a comedian. And that's actually a, it's one of these things, right? We live in, the, we live in a world where, um, let's say actually run back the clock. So a thousand years ago, um, there were like nine jobs. And what your great grandfather did is what you were probably gonna do. And you didn't need to change it very much. Like stacking a, a rock on top of a rock, once you kind of figured out the basics, was the way it was gonna be. Thatching, right? The, the science of thatching is more or less figured out and it's not changed. And then, you know, as you fast forward, what ends up happening is there's more and more things that we have to have had to learn how to do, and they're changing faster and faster. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's funny, it's a, an odd thing to say, but I think it's actually quite true to say that if you're trying to imagine, like if I was gonna have a 15-year-old kid come to me and say, well, what, what kinds of things might I want to study to be able to be really capable in the world that's happening? Say, well, perhaps you should learn how to do MMA, uh, stand-up comedy, and then, you know, maybe figure out how to create your own um, public media and uh, persona. And if, what's funny is that all those are available. As you said, like your son is right now doing Roblox. He's already learning 19 yeah. fundamental skills in that environment. Mm -hmm. And it's these base skills, right, that are core, so. Yeah, Scott Adams has this idea of uh, the talent stack. Like if you're gonna be successful in the modern world and able to navigate, having a bunch of complementary skills, like a whole bunch of them. So rather than being fucking good at one thing, like you're the best in the world at one thing, but that's all you've ever done, that's a lot of your success is gonna rely on luck at that point, mm -hmm. of being in the right position to be able to execute with that one thing. If you have a bunch of complementary things, this is what I've done, I realize. I like, just out of forced necessity, I've, I've made music, but I then forced myself to learn graphic design and video editing and social media and marketing and all these other things in order to complement that. And now I have a bunch of these fucking skills at a pretty high level. That, that all work together to mean that I can function and release uh, music and videos and things like three times a week, speedily. Mm -hmm. I can do all these things. So, yeah. The... Well, I mean, I, I think that we talked about, I know how this, the timeline works here. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how to reference or invokes what to me is in the recent past, which may in media world be in the distant future. But mm -hmm. this notion of there being a, an actual stack in terms of, of like information, knowledge, skill, Capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a there's a basis there. So like mm -hmm. you may have have learned information about um, what was it what was one of the skills that you just mentioned oh, design. So I might read a book on design. I've just absorbed information. Well, I may have knowledge, meaning that I've now been able to learn. Like I know it. I know the information. Well, then a skill is very different, right? I've actually practiced it in some way. Mm -hmm. I've learned how to actually use it in some fashion. But then a capacity is even deeper, which is maybe the ability to have to read and the yeah. ability to understand how to build a skill is a capacity. And so you know, as the world becomes more complex and as things change, you have to go deeper in the stack. And the fact that I may know something is irrelevant. Google knows everything better than I know anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The fact that I have a certain amount of skill is relevant, but it's changing. It needs to be glued together. So these capacities, the deep capacities are the things that are, are, are invariant, right? And so that's the stuff that's at the depth. Can I bridge for a little bit though? Because there was actually an interesting point that I'm not sure if it's useful that it might, I felt, I felt deeply called to actually channel Heather Hang um, mm. in the high and low culture. Mm. Um, so she, she particularly calls out, at least in my experience, I don't know what she's been doing publicly, is um, this notion of, um, so high culture is, a, is an evolutionary niche and low culture is an evolutionary niche, which is to say that there's an audience, the rich or the aristocratic, uh, and there's a, uh, a, a producer artists of a certain sort, who over time learn how to figure out how to explore that niche. And so they realize that creating music of a certain sort appeals to the tastes of this particular subset, and this particular subset appreciates it, oftentimes largely just so that they have the ability to exclude other people and show that they're posh and smart, right? Yeah. High culture is that direction. Low culture is a different set of things you're trying to uh, appeal to, right? Low culture doesn't necessarily have as much of a need or, or a value in trying to differentiate themselves from other people, but if they can have a good laugh, right, if they can actually feel a certain sense of connection or a sense of uproariousness, good, right, so different values. Um, well, there's this concept in evolution called hybrid vigor, where as if the niche, if the, if the niche between the, the uh, aristocracy and the common people is separate for a long time, these skills specialize here and these skills specialize here and they're different, they're twain, right? We have high and low cultures concepts. But when this thing starts to break down, when a new niche emerges, 
these skills need to reconnect with these skills, right? You need to have, like a Joe Rogan, you need to have a sensibility of the low culture. Mm. How do I get the guy to laugh? But then like, maybe like a Russell Brand, you also have the sensibility of, okay, what are these things that kind of titillate the, these sensibilities and build a sharpness or capacity, and you can combine them, you have hybrid vigor. You have this new species which has a vastly higher capability of exploring a new space, a novel environment. And I think it's re reasonable to say that we're in a novel environment. I kind of get the sense with the IDW at the moment that it's, it's an initial kind of stake in the ground for a new kind of conversation. It's sort of, it's almost like people gathering together to say, okay, we need to be able to have conversations about these certain topics. So I kind of sense that it's already doing its job in terms of staking out kind of a, an area to have that. Where do you think that goes? Do you think we end up with this kind of cinematic universe getting more and more characters? Is this something that's going to continue to grow, do you think? Once this thing has happened once and it comes the bravery aspect, oh shit, you can go out there and talk about these things and, and you don't die. They don't kill you immediately. You don't get like you don't lose your job immediately or whatever, so more people will do it. And then you then there's more of an appetite for it. It's normalized to an extent, so it doesn't seem weird anymore that like people are running around with capes, suddenly, well fuck, I could do that too. You know, and then you have mm. people who only and then you've got a world of the youngest younger people who've only ever known a world of capes. Mm. And that's completely normal then. And then you can have really fucking big conversations. So it can, it can only grow, and it can only get more interesting. I'm going to extend this, or take this as a, as a push, which is, if you think about the, the notion of, say, counterculture, mm. if you think about the, what was the line, um, say hello to the new boss, same as the old boss? Mm -hmm. If you think about what the IDW is doing as being just a counterculture to a centralized narrative structure, I think that's wrong. That's not the point. Mm. And so you, I, what I would say is what happens next is what's happening right here. Because on the one hand, we're not part of the IDW, right? And there's no real particular intent or notion of this being like the IDW Junior League, which is endeavoring to figure out how to become the IDW. Like, are we using this to become part of that? No. But on the other hand, we're, we're representing the same process. We're representing the same field, which is say, okay, how do we come together and begin to have conversations? How do we actually practice this thing that is about how we come together and become more capable as individuals and as groups at being able to think and to be able to ultimately make better choices and be able to do things in the world. Mm -hmm. And so what I would expect or hope is kind of like a rhizomatic growth that mm -hmm. you'll begin to see a proliferation of mm -hmm. quite diverse and heterogeneous groups. Like you said, the West Coast Avengers just pop up. Mm -hmm. And they aren't about, well, I guess Hawkeye was, but they weren't about <laughs> becoming a member of the Avengers. They were about doing their own thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's the idea, right? Is that it's because this playing field is in yeah. fact perfectly flat, it is smooth across the board, it's now more of a, this is a way to play a game. This is a new kind of game, a new kind of way of playing it, and it is no longer at all about the old boss. It's actually about a completely new dynamic. I guess this is what thinking looks like, and now you've seen what thinking looks like, maybe you can do it yourself. Yeah, this is, you know, this, yeah. is, this, this is a superhero. Mm. This is what a superhero is, this is what he does, this is what he stands for. He's trying to, he fucking wants to save the world. Uh, he's, he's an emblem of, of the potential of humanity. Mm. And we're at this point where we're about to, as we've talked about, but it's either fucking death and destruction or glory and wonder. Mm. It's either like everything squandered or the potential realized, mm. like sort of nowish, you know. Mm. Uh, the time is now and only you can save mankind, mm. uh, which is the sort of message of the superhero or whatever, which is. The, the message of the superhero isn't mm. someone's going to fucking fly in and save your ass. It's like only you can fucking save what needs saving and that's what you need to do is become that. In your that. own personal life. Yeah, become that. Yeah. Or whatever it happens to be. I mean, you, yeah. may, you it may actually be in a position where you're helping save something in some other environment. Yeah, you might actually need to save the actual world. Yeah, you may it, might, be, it actually you. might be that big. Yeah. Mm. That's fucking possible. Yeah. That's a potentiality at this point. <laughs> but of course now I, it's funny because we now have this in the environment. I can, I can say that, but also be mindful of part of the message that Peterson is spreading, which is, it's not necessarily the case that it's your particular responsibility yes. to save the world. And not everybody needs to run out in a fucking costume and bang someone around the head. Because like, <laughs> you'll get fucked up. If you're not ready, if you haven't done the training, like, not, you know what I mean? You can't be, go, out, be, go out there and be Luke Cage if you don't know how to punch it. And I guess the other, the other superpower is the ability to have the conversations which is what you were talking about with courage, the, the ability to get yourself into the space mm. where you can have a generative conversation is in itself a kind of superpower. 
from this bunch we talked about outside the notion of curation as well, mm. which is the same kind of skill set. So in a conversation, there's a notion of me listening to you and trying to, out of the thing that is being endeavoring to be expressed, mm. how do I identify the highest possible aspect of that? Because there are many, right? And of course, in t traditional debate, I try to find the lowest aspect and turn what you're saying into some you know, bullshit. <laughs> My effort is to try to find the highest aspect and bring that out and then send something back to you that is honoring what you said. Right? I'm not changing. I'm just trying to listen and bring it up. Mm. Well, we can do that in a conversation. That's how you have a good conversation. right? We actually, oh, hey, I'm, that's neat. That's interesting. Let me add more to that. Is there more here? Mm. But you can also do that in, in the meta conversation. Mm. And if you're watching this video, you're part of the conversation, but at a meta level. You can curate it. You can upregulate it and share it. Or you can add your own voice to it. As that's the idea. Is we can actually recognize that the same set of skills to be, well, honestly, just to be in relationship with yourself well just to be able to speak and think clearly as an individual in congruence and integrity shows up as the set of skills to be able to do it as a group and then as it turns out to do it as a collection, as a community. Yeah, en masse. This is one of the things that people don't necessarily talk about with regards to the influence of YouTube is that the, the, the way that people act, interact with the YouTube video pretty much according to research is they look at the video they start watching it and then immediately scroll down the comments mm. almost immediately. Mm. So the, the the comments section, people reacting to the video, is seen as much as the actual thing itself. Mm. It like is as important. We were talking about this earlier in regards to I think it was a dreadful mistake for uh, the conversations with Peterson and Harris to not be broadcast live. Yeah, I agree. They should have been streamed live. People could be, everyone would be getting in the information at the same time and kind of like working on it together at the same time and the, there would have been a vast conversation. It's ridiculous. Uh, and a big part of that, it's Peterson talks about how he likes to speak live and he can see from the reactions of people out there, like how is things, how it's going down and that's the comment section. Now, you know, YouTube comment sections can be full of morons, but they're also full of, what's the opposite of a moron? I don't know. But whatever. Like, I, I see some... People who are watching this, they're the I opposite of morons. I see some very intelligent <laughs> people in my comment section. My comment section is like 99% like smart thinking humans who have something valuable to add. Well, it's funny. I mean, we, we, we have this uh, um, Peterson and Admiral McRaven, mm -hmm. the guy who said, Peterson, clean your room, McRaven is make your bed. Mm -hmm. But we have this sort of bite-sized ethical mandates, mm -hmm. you know, things that anybody where they are can do, and it's good. It's going to make a move. So here's an example. Make better comments. Because mm -hmm. you said it's, it can be horrifying. And it can be horrifying because okay. for whatever reason, many people believe it's appropriate mm -hmm. to be irresponsible in their comments. Mm -hmm. Hey, but guess what? There's also a personal responsibility on the part of the curator mm. of the comments section, which sure. is the person who runs the channel. And some people think, uh, oh, it's, it's anti-free speech to like delete a, a, like a rude comment or something. I personally think this is my house. You do not come in my house and spread shit over the walls. And if you do, I immediately remove you from my fucking house. I consider that just <laughs> sort of good modeling. Yeah, because yeah. it's what's the what's the theory of like you go you know you go into a neighborhood and broken it's all, windows. Yeah, the broken window thing. Yeah. Exactly. I think it's the same with that. So anyone who runs a YouTube channel has a huge responsibility. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna just let your comment section turn yeah. into a ghastly shit show, then that's that's what you're putting out into the world, and that's what you're gonna propagate. Well, let's like, let's maybe we can just put a stake in the heart of of what the idea of free speech is, because I, it's shocking to me that we live in a moment where that still isn't clear. Yo. So, what is this concept? And I think we're living in an environment now we can even be able to say it quite clearly, which is free speech is about the degree to which one is able to provide high quality, high bandwidth signal mm -hmm. that is insightful. Mm -hmm. right, so free speech is that. So if, you, if I convey to you high quality, meaning that the, there's a clarity of expression, mm -hmm. high fidelity, meaning it is in fact actually precisely what it is that I am perceiving and endeavoring to express. I am not lying or manipulating. I'm not trying to do anything with it other than express what it is in. Mm -hmm. High bandwidth, meaning there's a whole lot to it, mm -hmm. and deep insight, which is the thing that's being expressed is worthy of being expressed at the level that's being expressed. Right? So those characteristics are what free speech is. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're violating any one of those four parameters, then you're not engaging in free speech. Right? So if I censor you, I'm doing something which is shutting down at a minimum the bandwidth. Right? If I am misinterpreting you, I'm shutting down, uh, say, the fidelity of what's happening. If I'm manipulating you, I'm definitely shutting down the fidelity. I mean, I'm, I'm hijacking the communications channel. Mm -hmm. So we could have really used information theory, which we probably ought to, since we live in the information age, to redefine this character, this concept, in a modern way. It actually makes much more clear the thing we're dealing with. And so it helps clarify. 
if I'm running a message board and people are engaging in things that are creating noise, mm. right? They're not actually generating either insight. They're not actually taking the time to have something to say before they vomit on the web, web page. Or, of course, they're engaging in trolling, which is to say they're engaging in expression that pretends to be one thing but is in fact something else. These are all just forms of noise. And so we can, it's not hard to identify them as noise. It's very clear that those are all noise Great. It may not be obvious that a particular thing happens to be noise, but it's clear that if it is trolling and not authentic expression, then it is noise and we can just eliminate it. And then what ends up happening is, as you say, then you've now generated a venue where everybody's beginning to see, oh, okay, I get what good action actually looks like. Exactly. So this yeah. is the thing that's is, this, this is lacking. It's, this is such a new thing. It's, it's such, a, such a, everything, this is this vast experiment. And so you have a situation where you can go in and just say what you think immediately, and it's seen by lots of people. That's very exciting for people. Mm -hmm. It's like this sort of drug rush. Vroom, I can go on that tweet thread of that famous person, and lots of people will see me say this thing, and I'm a fucking hero. Mm -hmm. And there's not been enough time mm -hmm. passed for people to really work out, A, the uh, repercussions of that on a, on a big sort of societal level. Because it is big repercussions, the fact that you can, yeah. the top comment of whatever thing is, is seen by almost as many people as the main thing, and that top comment... What was that first? Was that? <laughs> <laughs> no, we've kind of moved past that. That, yeah. was, that was like 2010, 2012, yeah. you know. That's when people said no homo a lot, mm. and uh, things like that. It seems like such a bygone era. It seems like such a long time ago. Mm -hmm. It's that the era? emergence of high culture in our particular new vernacular. Yeah, so this is yeah. this new, new world, and the, the rules haven't quite been laid down yet, and people don't quite know how to act yet, but they're starting to. I'm seeing it starting to happen. I'm seeing comment sections getting a lot more useful, and this is, curation is a big part of this. Yeah. And you said something really interesting as well, that a lot of people who are commenting are actually in broadcast mode rather than digital mode, that in some sense, if you're responding to someone at something as, yes, I like this, no, I don't like this, that's actually broadcast, whereas digital is, this is what I like about this, and this is what I don't like about this. Yeah. There's a constructive, there's a dialogue, there's an implicit dialogue yeah. in commenting on digital that there isn't with broadcast. Yeah, just think about the, the, the mental, um, the, the metaphor mm. uh, of the former is I'm changing the channel. Yeah. Right? And that's the, that's the psychology of broadcast mode, where I have no authority or capacity or ability to interact or express on my own. The only power I have is to change the channel. So it's to remove my attention. That's all I have, right? Yeah. But in the interactive environment, I have the ability, and therefore have the duty of learning how to well, wield that power well, mm -hmm. of curating with detailed nuance, upregulating and downregulating, and then also adding. Mm -hmm. I can actually express into it. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, I think it's, 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 it's novel. And yeah. the environment we've exited has been one that is very different. So not only is it a place where we're having to build new skills, but these new skills are quite different mm. to the old skills. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you're, you're essentially like, when you move into the suburb, when, when the suburbs extends itself, yeah. and people begin to grow lawns in places they didn't used to have, like here in San Diego where it's desert, you get this very interesting experience of actually watching an ecosystem develop. Mm. In the first season, there are no bugs because it was desert. In the second season, the bugs have come. The third season, the birds come. Um, and it's over about 10 years, you finally get an ecosystem. Yeah. We're kind of doing that, yeah. right? And the, the no homo homo and the first guys, they were bugs. Mm. They, yeah, they yeah, exploding an open yeah. niche. It's interesting as well. I think you've just explained the moral rule that you were saying with, um, is that people who are comment have power. And with that comes responsibility. Yeah, and that, that if we're, yeah, that as curators, it's okay to, to remove people who are not ex exercising yes. their power. Now, the people who notice this first in, uh, the, I don't know what part of the comic book analogy this is, but this is, ties in with the, the new, where we're going. But it was the, the smart trolls, the ones who realized that they did have a power and they had a power to change things mm -hmm. in a chaos magic type fashion. Mm -hmm. They had a power to sort of collectively push sort of ideas and change people's perceptions of people via sort of like meme affiliations or outright falsehoods or weird jokes or creepiness or whatever it is. This was a thing that a generation discovered. They discovered they had a huge sort of what would have been previously called sort of chaos magical power. And now you have a whole sort of generation who are aware of that as a complete normal thing, as in, that's just normal, that's real. It's not theoretical. It's not me jacking off over a sigil in a room hoping I can find my car keys. Well, it is sometimes. Yes, 
it's <laughs> that never worked for me, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, Grant Morrison. Didn't work. But uh, it's a thing that you've seen as a pra as practical. Really, really works. You can sort of all gather together and change the course of of discourse or history or whatever by combined action. So the first people who discovered that it's kind of like the way porn dictates technological movements. Mm. You know, it wasn't necessarily the sort of most useful use of that power or the best use of that power, or the most heroic use of that power, or whatever. But it's out there now, and people know. Mm. So now it's a thing that can be harnessed for good, and can be harnessed for uh, sort of heroic, super heroic means of like saving the world and shifting the culture and all that sort of thing. Yeah. There's like a whole bunch of kids who just know that that works, they can do it, mm. it's completely useful and usable. So then it's like, oh, what, what can we do with that power today? Yeah, so that would be the, the meaning of the IDW at its depth. It is rediscovering and re-presenting the hero archetype mm. in this new environment. And then inviting anyone to become a hero. To actually say, okay, well this is what it feels like, this is what it looks like. And as you said, yeah. and anybody can, in fact in some sense everybody both should and must. Yeah, exactly, that's the thing, you actually must. Issues. Yeah, you must. But it's not easy and you have to put in lots of work. Mm. You, know, this is, you can't just put on a cape and jump off a building and expect to fly. Uh, this is... The calling of the IDW. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And you know, does this be? Um, I, I'd like to. So Eric Weinstein is a very smart guy, and, and you're not likely, if you're just sort of a person out in the world, to, to sort of wake up one morning and have his level of intelligence and dedication. Um, but we're just people. Like, there's nothing about us that makes us. You, one somebody could decide Dude, to. Read comic books. Die, yeah, we do to read comic books, right? There's not. I, I'm not a differential geometer. Um, but if you just decide to enter into this kind of conversation, that's the beginning. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing how rapidly just the process of learning from other people, mm -hmm. listening, learning how to listen, mm -hmm. learning how when you're, you're shutting people down because for whatever reason your fear or anger is causing you not to listen, and then learning, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. How rapidly that just builds these skills. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's not, I might want to say it's not hard, it's actually hard, yeah. but it's not the kind of thing that effectively everybody couldn't do. It's the thing that everybody can do, and this is a thing that's been emerging recently in the conversation, is that for many, many years we were told we were stupid, mm -hmm. and that we could only handle six minutes of television, and actually our attention spans were getting shorter and shorter, and we were just absolute fucking mm. idiots. And we could only handle by, like tweet information on MTV or whatever it was. It turns out that was completely untrue. It turns out we can sit down for like three hours and listen to someone talking about something that we know nothing about and that we're very interested in it. And it's not just like a little niche section of the population over here and everyone else is stupid, dumb, staring at the TV. It's actually way bigger than that and it's probably most people it's looking like now. It's actually looking like most people are really fucking smart mm -hmm. and most people's capability for uh, handling these kinds of subjects and expanding upon them. Mm. We you don't even know what the limits Jordan, are. You look at the Jordan Peterson phenomena. It's like someone talking about Bible lectures, incredibly deep Bible lectures. Yeah, it's fucking touring, and the touring deepest, fucking the stadiums. And he's, yeah, and he's fucking stadiums. stadiums. <laughs> yeah. Um, which Jordan Peterson also came to mind when you were discussing um, the nature of that conversation because there's something in the, the, the sort of the symbology of the Christ archetype is that you die to yourself every moment and there's something in allowing parts of yourself to die off to be reborn like things that were wrong so mm -hmm. in, in, in engaging in these conversations where you're allowing parts of yourself to die off but maybe beliefs that you had before or things that are stopping you there's a sense of, as he also says, that you have to allow your dead wood to be burned, yeah, burned off. If the river stops flowing, then it stagnates and lots of shit grows in it. Well, it's funny because, um, you know, if we had been in, I don't know, 1880s or so, this would not have been a particularly notable insight. Um, I don't know why, but you know, many people uh, had the basic insight of you know, let the, the, the dead wood burn off that your job is to constantly be renewing yourself oh, yeah. in the context of a particular situation. Um, back then it had more of the basic sense of like being tough, like being honest, being strong, being powerful in the world, that you have to learn and allow yourself to grow. Now we can actually do it in, I think, in a more fully realized way to, and therefore not have secret things that are sort of embedding themselves and surrounding themselves and having, allowing things to burn off except for them. We can actually be completely open whatever happens to be coming through and build like a very deep sensitivity. Uh, what was this? Oh, it was Nietzsche. That tune to philosophize with a hammer yeah. and the notion that it's a sculptor's hammer. Mm. It's not a sledgehammer. 
It's a thing that knocks away precisely that which prevents the statue from revealing itself. Mm -hmm. And so de developing a level of artistry with self mm -hmm. so that you can actually allow precisely that which should go away. Like, what is the dead wood? Yeah. It's not obvious. Mm -hmm. Getting skillful at that is a powerful skill.